This is Phelan and Myers, two for 20 with the Phelan and Myers Wealth Management Group of Janie Montgomery Scott. Janie, a member of FINRA, SIPC, and the New York Stock Exchange, maintains a presence in Duluth with their office at 6340 Sugarloaf Parkway, Suite 130 in Duluth, Georgia. And this is Scott Phelan with uh, Phelan and Myers Wealth Management Group. This is Phelan and Myers Two for Twenty. I'm here with my always handsome business partner Kevin Myers, and we are talking about get too crazy there. <laughs> <laughs> he has a face for radio, like, like, like I said. We're talking today about charitable giving, and we have Randy Redner with us from the Community Foundation for Northeast Georgia. So, Randy, do you mind just kind of introducing? Sure. Introduce sure, sure. yourself. Tell us Good a morning, bit about guys. What you do. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. Randy Redner, CEO of the Community Foundation, been there seven years now, Scott. In fact, you, I think I'm pretty sure you were board chair that hired me, so you were the one that created the mistake. On that, on, <laughs> best on best that. decision we ever that's made. Right, I absolutely right. got to give you credit. That's, so. that's right. That's right. So can you talk a little bit about the role of a community foundation as it relates to other charities in the community? Sure. So, you know, community foundations, we are a 501c3. So, they, you know, boom, we're, you know, right there with the other nonprofits in the community. But very different, very unique. There's only eight 100, 900 community foundations in the entire country. And our job in many ways is to, to you know, work with our fund holders, folks that bring money to us, and help them figure out where, where best to do that work. So, back in, Scott, back in my days of running Habitat for Humanity or American Cancer Society or at the United Methodist Children's Home working in foster care, I was getting up every morning like typical nonprofit executive and thinking about, gosh, how do I help kids with foster care? How do I build more houses that... At the Community Foundation, I wake up every morning and go, how do I get more resources in? Certainly financial resources, some are educational resources, some are leadership and connectivity resources, and then parse those out to nonprofits in our community so they can accelerate the work that they're doing. Because they've got their head down, right? They're trying to do their program and get through it this this week and take care of those kids. And they don't have time to think of the bigger picture or the longer-term picture, and that's where we come in. You know, if they're flying at 10,000 feet, we're flying at 30,000 feet and trying to help them. So you have a connection with not only fund holders and donors in the community, but also some of the nonprofits in town. Is that fair to say? Right. So so you know the vast majority, right. I would think, yeah. and kind yeah. of what they do. And right. So, what, you know, what we like to say is what we sell is community knowledge. So our tagline is, you know, connect people who care to causes that matter meaning we have to understand who are the people that care. Kevin, that's all your clients that you bring to me, right? Yep. Yep, yep. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> you know, and to the, you know, the causes that matter. We have to understand what are the nonprofits working on? What are the key issues in the community? And community can be, gosh, it can be a little local city. It could be a neighborhood. It could be metro Atlanta. It can be the country. It can be what's going on in Ukraine at the moment. That is a community that needs help, and we need to be able to connect people who care to what's going on in Ukraine, and we are doing that right right now. So we have that community knowledge that our fund holders don't have time, right? Mm-hmm. They are running life. They're running their business. They're getting kids to soccer. They're trying to make church. They're trying to do everything that life takes them, but they want to go do something, you know, really, really great, and they've been blessed to be able to do that. Well, we're, we're their connection to that, and we bring that knowledge around philanthropy to them and then say, hey, you want to go, you know, do some work in special needs, or you want to go do some work in foster care or affordable housing. Let us connect and help you make that happen. And then the real fun, and you've seen this, you know, Scott and Kevin, you've seen it too, is where we connect families together. And we know that two, three, or four, five of them, uh, last year it was building a special needs playground. And we knew 10 of our families really care about that. They could fund it, and we funded it in less than a week, right, mm-hmm. and help that that nonprofit or in that instance it was a school go fund that so can you can you explain because i think most of our listeners have probably heard of a foundation Mm -hmm. but when they think of a foundation they think of the bill gates foundation as an example which is a private foundation correct can you explain the distinction between an individual like a bill gates who's worth billions right right. that starts their own foundation and then a community foundation right yep so you know again yeah family foundations and sometimes we get a lot of conversation questions around corporate foundations i have a business and i want to set up my corporate foundation well the good news is 
you know, to do each of those costs a lot of time and a lot of money to set those set those up, right? And then all of a sudden you're into filing taxes every year and doing audits, and you're into you're running a business, right? With the community foundation, you know, we can do all of that work behind the scenes for them, and they can just set up their their fun with us and we are their 501 c3 so we handle all the back office so you know kevin people come families come to us and go you know i've always wanted to set up a family foundation and i'm going i always tell them unless you got about 20 million bucks and a lot of time let us just handle that for you so you can just concentrate on your giving so you know all of that um effort that they they do but they can also grow into a family foundation if they want. They can start with us and then grow up and say, hey, I want to go do that. But the trend is actually the reverse. We're seeing a lot of family foundations that were set up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they're going, I am tired of all the work. I just want to give my money away. I just want to go do good. Can I collapse my family foundation back to the community foundation? Which An- answer is yes. Which one other distinction is in a private foundation, you have to, correct me if I'm wrong, distribute mm-hmm. out 5% a year of the account balance where in a, in a public foundation like you guys are, you, there is not that requirement. And with a community foundation using a tool called a donor advised fund, under current regulations, the boys and girls in Washington love to look at this, especially right about now, but it has never changed. In the donor advised funds were set up in the 1930s, so I don't think it's going to change. But no, that money can sit there inside that fund, inside our 501c3 for generations to come, if that's what they choose. So let's do. say I've, I've got you know charitable intent, mm-hmm. okay, and it gets down to the end of the year, and I say there's all these different charities I want to give to. I want to give to the homeless. I want to give to Ukraine. I want to do all of these things. So I can give directly to a charity Mm -hmm. or I can give to a foundation like you guys. Mm -hmm. What are the benefits of giving to a foundation versus giving directly to a charity? I mean, why would I want to be involved with the foundation versus just giving directly to my church as an example? Right. Yeah. So most of the time, a couple of things. One, you know, we're trying to combine all of your giving into one nice easy place right so you're centralized in your giving and there's one giving account it's like your uh, charitable checkbook right as we often describe it so it's all that giving including we can handle your tithing to your church all out of one nice neat place so it brings that all together and it's all all of that two we bring that knowledge that i talked about earlier to help you accelerate and and do your giving with bigger impact so we're going to make it easier and we're going to make it more impactful. While we hold your money at the community foundation and you get your tax write off the moment you put your money in, so you get your tax write off right then, boom, that's good, right? And then we're going to invest it for you. So you're making a little bit of money while it, you know, it's sitting there. So you've got that advantage to it as well. And then one thing, just mm-hmm. as an aside that I've also seen is, is if if somebody has a particularly good year in business, they may say, hey, I, I really need some large tax deductions this year. Correct. So they'll make a large, maybe larger than typical <clears throat> charitable contribution because they get the full deduction this year. The money right. goes into their donor advised fund in this example. Yeah. And then they have discretion to, right. to distribute it out at some unknown point down the road. Correct. Yeah, so yeah. That's, and that strategy is called bunching, and we see that every year, you mm-hmm. know, especially – uh, a lot of times you see it in the construction industry and in, in the families that we work with that run construction businesses. And, you know, that business kind of goes up and goes down. And when they have a good year, yep, they do exactly that. I'm going to put a bunch in there at one time, get my tax write off. I'm going to forward seed my giving for the next couple of years. And then I'm going to work with Randy and the team to make really good decisions on how that money is used in our community. Okay. And then can you hit a little bit more on donor advised funds and then what can be contributed into a donor advice fund just kind of how they work so sure. if i'm again i maybe i have a really good year and i say i, I want to you know i need some large tax deductions what's happens just can you walk me through that right yeah so donor advised fund great tool again that was created in the 1930s by actually the uh, new york community foundation was the big lobbyist that got that that done so somebody can be a family or an individual can set up that fund with us they can transfer you know bring us cash put that in they get their tax write off right then um, as you guys know, appreciated assets are really big for donor advised funds. They've been sitting on that Apple stock or that Tesla stock for you know a decade or more, so they don't want to pay any taxes on that appreciated assets. Uh, a lot of the advisors we look uh, work with will say, 
I never want you writing a check again. You know, the only way you're going to make donations is out of your donor advised funds because every time you lose a tax advantage when you pull it out of your back pocket or write it out of your checkbook. But it can also be other assets, Scott. We work with folks that will donate property. We work with families that will donate a por portion of their business, right? They're thinking about selling. It's time. You know, we've been at it for 30 years. We're tired of doing it, Kevin. You know, da da da, da. We're going to get rid of that top golf business or whatever they got into and created. And so they can donate a portion of that business, you know, to us as well. It can be cars. It can be boats. It can be racehorses. I don't care, right? You know, we will can take in that asset, convert it for you, put it into your donor advised fund, and off you go. When on the corporate side, I just wanted to double check the sequencing is important, is it not, on just making sure that that document is set up before they sell the company? So pre-sale is critical in this. I cannot tell you, Kevin, how many times I have gotten somebody call me in December and say, hey, I'm about to close on my business, right? I got to have it closed by December 31st. I'm ready to do the thing. You know, and I go, you can't do it then, right? It has to be arm's length and it has to be before you you even look at any offers on your business, right? That you know, that's the, you know, IRS is giving you a deduction, so they want an arm's length done before before that time. So there you go. And then what about uh, required distributions, required minimum distributions for, for individuals that are 72 or older and have to take money out of a retirement account? How right. do those work? Yeah. So, you know, that's been a, you know, a great thing over the last couple of years. And I think that goes back, you guys check me on this. That was 2017 tax legislation that went in that created that opportunity for people to take RMDs and start to give them either directly to a, um, a charity, right, and not have to pay any of the gains on that because they just don't need that money. Or they can uh, set, a, uh, set up an account at the community foundation, direct that RMD to us, and then we can work w again over time on where to give that money away. But they don't then get binged on paying taxes on that money. And gosh, nowadays we've got, you know, uh, that baby boomer generation that is turning older, a lot of RMD money. They, you know, are in really good financial shape, and but they got to take it, right? You know, what do we do with it? And they don't so, want to pay taxes on it generally, correct. and it's a way to avoid yep. yeah, some yep. of the taxes. And they want to go do good, right. and they want you know to their church, to their you know whatever from from there. And so, absolutely, community foundations are a great place because again, you're not giving it right then, and you're done with it. You're giving it, putting it in a fund, and you can give it out over time. Yep. So let's say for whatever reason. You, you don't know you're not necessarily interested in giving during life but you're interested in hey if something happened to me my kids are going to be more than taken care of mm -hmm. and i'd like to do some good if i passed away right yeah how does that work you know i think you'll call it legacy giving can you just kind of walk us through that a yeah little bit? no and you know again because uh, the baby boom generation and you know and it's, it's uh on one side, it's got, you know, one of our trends in America is give while you live, right? There's no, it's no longer the Rockefeller and Ford approach. People and families want to do it now, which is great. On the other side, there's the legacy side, you know, where they want to transfer the values with the valuables, right? And we, we work with families in kind of three ways. Just had this call yesterday from um, some folks up in uh, North Georgia, and they're kind of walking through. And I said, at the end of the day, just to simplify it, three avenues, right? One, you can leave the money to the community foundation, and we have our own endowment, and we give money out of that endowment every year. And you can just put it in there, and you can just say, you guys take care of it. I trust you, you know, in the future. Second, you can say, ah, you know, don't want to do that. I want to, you know, leave a legacy. I want to create an endowment upon my passing um, and give you guys some direction. Uh, for us, you know, often we talk about Mary and David Kistner, who 20 years ago, no children, created an endowment for the arts very specific arts in Gwinnett County right this could be you could set up for the arts for metro Atlanta or the country or whatever but you know you leave us some direction we get to know you you know your family before you pass away we understand what's coming in the will uh, and that and then you say okay I want to do, do this and we continue to do that and what other organization in perpetuity is going to watch that money and take care of that and it was great Last week, we went and saw the new Mary Kistner Art Gallery at the Aurora Theater. 20 years later, that mm -hmm. was created for, for her. You know, and then finally, we work with families that go, okay, we want to leave an endowment to you, 
because we don't trust the kids, right? <laughs> you know, and, but, but Randy, you know, you get to work with the kids, right? Good luck with that. But we're going to leave, you know, our endowment with you with some direction, but we want you to work with the next generation of our family around that giving uh, and what they want to do and how they, and some of them split it, Scott, but those are the basic three avenues. We can handle it for you. You tell us what to do. Third, we'll work with your family into the future. And is there any type of investment that is uh, the best to leave upon somebody's passing from a tax perspective? Does it make any difference if it's life insurance or real estate or an IRA or anything like that? Is that? I think on that, you know, every family is unique and different, right? How much assets are you trying to convert in, in that? How much do they have in each of those buckets and kind of that? And we're not tax experts, right? We're going to, you know, lean on your tax experts, or we can bring them in and take a look at that and make the most tax efficient decision for you and your family. I got you. I think we talked a lot about the benefits. Are there any things that people should be aware of when they set one up? Once they donate the money, what kind of controls do they have? Can they receive any benefits from where the money goes? That kind of thing. Right. Well, look at you. Yeah, 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 yeah. When we appreciate you and Amanda being, you know, fund holders at the Community Foundation, you've been through this drill, right? You know, so I get it. So, you know, one, it is a donor advised fund. You know, as moment you put that money into the Community Foundation and into your fund, you get your tax write off. So you cannot tell us what to do. That becomes an asset of the Community Foundation. You can advise us, right? Which means our board staff reviews it just to make sure it's a good nonprofit all checks all those boxes and then our board approves that distribution when you say hey i want to give five thousand dollars to the salvation army and and stuff like stuff like that so therefore you've gotten a full tax deduction kevin so when you call like you do every week and say hey i want to fund because i want to play some golf in this nonprofit," you know da 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 and uh, you can't do any sponsorships for golf tournaments or anything. You can't get any benefit back because you got a full write-off going in, yep. right? So between you and Scott, you know, you call one week, Scott calls the next, <laughs> and you guys go back and back and you know back and, back and forth on that. Yeah, when um, I think from, it's just good for people to know that um, the reason you get the immediate tax benefit is you truly are gifting the money at that point. You're just not necessarily deciding where you want it dispersed. Is correct. That, fair? that is exactly that is exactly right. But the, you know, the added value of a community foundation, and this is why we've grown three times over in the last five years, and this is why we think we're going to grow two times over, uh, especially coming through the pandemic, people really leaned on the community foundation, in- including other found family foundations that said, hey, Randy, you and your team know best what's on the ground and what's needed. We're going to send you the 50, or the 100,000, uh, even more money to us over the last two years and say, you distribute it. We trust you and what you're, what you're doing. So that added you know value that's that's the secret sauce if that doesn't have value to you you know exactly what you want to do with the money for whatever reason then work directly but you know that's what we bring not only for the current generation but for future generations kevin we get families that call us and go hey the kids are coming for you know spring break what are we gonna do with them you know randy can you guys find some volunteer opportunities for the kids can they go to the hudgens art center or the aurora theater for you know things and stuff like that so we enjoy that coming alongside our families to help them on what we call a journey of generosity and families will start at step one which is a wanderer they're just wandering around out there what to do with their money they have been blessed to be great business people right rockefeller said it it, it was harder for him to give away the money than to make the money. It was more painful. It was more everything, right, from, from there. So we enjoy, you know, that journey of generosity from you're a wanderer to that final stage. You are a community builder. You really understand what's going on. You know where you can make, and we help you target your donations into you can be, you know, a catalyst or an accelerator, right? There's never enough money. Americans would have wrote the check. 100 years ago to solve poverty there were that that social challenges will always be with us so you're trying to make very specific and targeted donations to accelerate and help the things that you care about yeah and, yeah one of the other things that is the, this a trick question no no no, no, no. <laughs> well, and I, I think you guys do a great job of adding value to the donors but i think one of the things that i was also impressed with is can you speak just briefly about how you actually help support and and 
the, the folks that where the money goes to help them on organizing and how to best utilize. Yeah, because we, we also watch the, you know, what I call the nonprofit ecosystem, right? You know, that we're, you know, working with that ecosystem, no matter, you know, is it a community, county level, or, you know, we do a lot of work in, in metro Atlanta level, or even across the nation and, and that kind of thing, and taking a look at, gosh, how do we help strengthen the nonprofits, right? There's 1.5 million of them. And what I like to say, Kevin, is about 20% of them are doing 80% of the work, right? And how do we invest in that 20% uh, and help them get bigger, stronger, faster? Because the needs are not getting any easier. They are far more complex than what they ever were. Uh, so how do we help them with, with leadership, both staff and volunteers? So we do a lot of training we just finished our nonprofit academy, had over 200 nonprofits with us, giving them five different lanes of, of training and developing. Right now, we're looking at a you know, new news only right here. Don't tell my board, guys. <laughs> you know, but we're, we're taking a look at an accelerator program, not an incubator, right? Let's not create more nonprofits. How do we accelerate? You know? And so there'll be programming to run certain nonprofits through and help accelerate their, their work. How do they get faster, stronger? better so they can go out and help us with this yeah. so good point yeah. you are paying attention i really like that yeah 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 kevin yeah every once or, in a right, while right? Yeah, yeah 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 oh i see the notes from amanda you know i see the notes from your wife there <laughs> yeah, exactly. ask randy about this yeah 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 oh and holly over here so yeah yeah i got it. you get you guys both married over your heads they are so. the brains of the operation yeah <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Thank you for, hey. for what you're doing in the community. Thank you for taking the time today. If listeners want to get in touch with you, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, so, you know, our website is www.cfneg.org, Community Foundation, Northeast Georgia. So they can just start there, my name and pictures plastered all over, and go from there. Perfect. Yep. Thank you again. This is Phelan and Myers, two for 20 with the Phelan and Myers Wealth Management Group of Janie Montgomery Scott. Janie, a member of FINRA, SIPC, and the New York Stock Exchange, maintains a presence in Duluth with their office at 6340 Sugarloaf Parkway, Suite 130 in Duluth, Georgia. The information provided here is taken from sources which we believe to be reliable, but the accuracy and completeness of such information is not guaranteed by us. This is not an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any securities. Opinions expressed are subject to change without notice and do not take into account the particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs of individual investors. Employees of Janie Montgomery Scott LLC or its affiliates may, at times, release written or oral commentary, technical analysis, or trading strategies that differ from the opinions expressed here. Investing may involve market risk, including possible loss of principal. Janie Montgomery Scott LLC, its affiliates, and its employees are not in the business of providing tax, regulatory, accounting, or legal advice. Any tax-related statements are not intended for and cannot be used or relied upon by any such taxpayer for the purpose of avoiding tax penalties. Any such taxpayer should seek advice based on the taxpayer's particular circumstances from an independent tax advisor. For more information about Janie, please see Janie's Relationship Summary Form, Form CRS, on Janie.com forward slash CRS, which details all material facts about the scope and terms of our relationship with you and any potential conflicts of interest. For a full description of Janie's Investment Advisory products and services, please refer to Janie's Form ADV Part 2, available on Janie's website or by contacting a Janie Financial Advisor.